Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lowe. I'm a professor of marine biology at Long Beach State University, and I'd like to welcome you to OceanWise. This is a program dedicated to understanding and, and looking at problems that face our coastline, the solutions that we use, and the future of our coastal ocean. The city of Long Beach is a large, vibrant coastline city that's strongly dependent on our ocean for food, for transportation of goods, for recreation, for economic growth and stability, and even for aesthetic pleasure. So not unlike many cities in Southern California, we face a number of problems dealing with increased human population and industry. And those, of course, have resulted in a number of problems to our coastal oceans in regards to overfishing, uh, pollution, and many other issues related to climate change. So one of the things we want to talk about in this show series is some of these problems and how we are going about dealing with those problems. What are the stem of those problems? What are some of our future solutions? I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Armstrong. He is the environmental supervisor for the ocean monitoring for the Orange County Sanitation District. And I'd also like to uh, welcome Dr. Erica Holland, who's an assistant professor of toxicology at Long Beach State University. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having, for having us. us. So let's talk about marine pollution. So if we can have the first slide. So quite often what people think about when they think of marine pollution is they think of something like an oil spill, right? But obviously marine pollution is far more complicated and, and more diverse than that. So Erica, can you kind of give us a toxicologist definition of what is marine pollution? Yeah, kind of a, a general definition would just be the fact of something um, introduced or present um, in the uh, marine environment that's uh, originated from anthropogenic activities. So that's a really broad definition, but it kind of um, encompasses the chemicals that we often might uh, associate with um, pollution. And it also uh, incorporates things such as light pollution or heat pollution that we may not think of often as a problem in coastal communities. So. Jeff, obviously you work at the sanitation district and of course your big thing is water quality, right? right? So, you know, from an ocean pollution standpoint and of course the sanitation districts do a lot to improve our water quality. So what can you tell us about ocean pollution from the standpoint of wastewater treatment? Well, from wastewater treatment, of course, the, the uh, thing that people think of most is what I'll call the yuck factor of sewage going out into the ocean. Of course, what goes out of the ocean is actually very highly treated, but uh, there are uh, bacteria and viruses associated with that. There's also chemical contaminants. While wastewater treatment is not designed to remove chemical contaminants, much of it is removed because it sticks to the solids. We remove the solids is what we do, and, uh, and those are taken and, and dealt with on land. Uh, but you know, there's also uh, non-traditional uh, things. We mainly think of like, like trash in the environment as a nuisance, but trash is actually very much a pollutant. And it's, uh, plastics have become very much into the forefront of the media, the, uh, the garbage patch in the North Pacific Gyre. Uh, but there's also like an emerging uh, issue with that, and that's microplastics. Uh, and so that's just now really being started to, to look at. Uh, nutrients in the environment uh, from wastewater solids, from uh, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, they act as uh, fertilizers for plankton, and uh, it's been suggested that they might be involved in exacerbating plankton blooms. And, uh, and then there's also, of course, the bacteria and viruses, which uh, you know, we t commonly test for along the shoreline. Right. So it sounds like pollution comes, obviously, from a wide variety of sources, but, but we identify those sources in certain ways. So if we can have the next slide. So obviously there are what we call point and non-point sources. So Erica, can you tell us a little bit about what those mean? Yeah, so I would say that I thought I would kind of start out with this idea of legacy. So there's actually quite a bit of legacy pollutants out there that um, were due to the fact before regulation, they kind of built up in certain areas and that legacy is really hard to get rid of. And then as you mentioned, we have the, the source and point source where source is easy to trace because it comes from one specific location. So for example, you might think of a oil pipeline as a great example of a source. Um, a pollutant source, um, where for our non-point source, they're a little bit harder to track to where they're coming from a, a large general area, and they're, for example, running into rivers where it's hard to identify the culprit for those types of sources of pollutants. So those examples might be things such as um, urban runoff, mm -hmm. to where things like once it rains, a lot of the pollution that comes from our um, traffic um, and car use will actually get into our water stream and ultimately into the ocean. 
or things such as residential runoff where people spray pesticides or other types of chemicals on their, um, their yards and when it rains again it goes down the, the storm drains into our rivers and ultimately into our um, oceans. Right. So obviously Long Beach is also known for having a huge port. So if we can have the next slide. So Jeff, ports are also considered kind of a point source of, of contaminants in some cases because you're bringing everything together in one spot. So it, can you talk a little bit about what ports do in terms of pollution and, and what we're doing to try to remedy some of those problems? Sure. Um, you know, L.A. Uh, Harbor and Long Beach Harbor are the top two largest commercial ports in the United States, and they're in the top 13 in the world. So obviously there's going to be a lot of activity. You know, you have the ships coming in, there's the exhaust from the ships, there's also the chemicals that are used to treat the hull uh, for anti-fouling, and, uh, and so, you know, some of those leach off into the water. Uh, on land, you have the associated truck traffic, and the train traffic to take these goods out to where they're ultimately going to go throughout our country. And so there's it, uh, things, the, the exhaust of course causes uh, air, air pollution and aerial deposition, but then you have the runoff, like Eric talked about, runoff when it rains, uh, that all drains lead to the ocean. And so that's no different, it drains right into the harbor. Uh, the LA Long Beach Harbor uh, authorities have been very, very aggressive in dealing with this. Um, in 2006, they started one action plan to start addressing this. In 2008, the state of California actually put uh, regulations in place that now require the ships to use cleaner fuels within 24 miles of our coastline. So that's been huge in reducing the emissions. And then in 2009, uh, the uh, port authorities for both ports again got together and they uh, put a, a 13 project action plan in place to uh, learn more about it, to uh, uh, as a pollution prevention and to mitigate the pollution that's already here. So I think the part that people have to remember is we're not just talking about water here, right? So we're talking about things that go into the air and the part that we have to remember is pretty much anything that goes into the atmosphere ends up in the ocean, one way or the other. So air pollution really is an important contributor to water pollution in many cases. So Erica, can you talk a little bit about, you know, that sort of atmospheric contribution and why maybe being conscious of air pollution is really important for ocean pollution? Yeah, I would say that a, a common example would be, for example, the exhaust that gets them from the car, so incomplete combustion from vehicles, where that actually will lead to a chemical entering into the environment known as polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, they're um, well known to be cancerogenic. And so they're also what we call volatile, so they'll leave the ground surface, for example, and enter into the atmospheric um, air. And then when it rains, then that will get deposited and ultimately end up in the oceans. And so that creates a, a large problem directly connecting our traffic and again, our um, use of cars. Um, there's other things such as power plants that might be um, burning coal, for example. They can release quite a bit of mercury into the environment, into the air. And mercury is actually one of the biggest problems that we have with fish consumption, where it gets into the ocean, it gets um, methylated actually, and builds up in fish, and then that becomes a, a major problem for people consuming fish. So, Jeff, we're talking about the ports as kind of a point source, and it's a very large point source. And of course, that's a really important part of Long Beach's economy. But we also have about 22 million people that live along our coastline, all of whom are going to the bathroom every day. <laughs> so, so everything gets dumped out a handful of pipes, right? Correct. Uh, like my agency, Orange County Sanitation District, we're the third largest wastewater treatment plant west of the Mississippi. County of LA and City of LA are, are larger than we are. Uh, but yeah, we treat approximately 185 million gallons a day of, of sewage, which to put that into context, that's enough to fill up Angel Stadium three times every day. That's a, a lot to deal with. But wastewater treatment has been very good. Uh, the Clean Water Act regulates what we do and they've mandated certain levels of treatment which have been very effective in removing pollutants and, uh, and material from the water. Um, the uh, water is generally, or the treated wastewater is generally uh, uh, taken out through an outfall pipe. Ours is almost five miles offshore at a depth of 200 feet uh, where the water is gently released into. And we are, <clears throat> excuse me, our, uh, our discharge is highly regulated. 
So obviously when people think of marine pollution and not just air pollution and water pollution, there's a lot of debris in the ocean, right? So if we can bring up the next slide, um, you know, this is the sort of marine debris that people expect in the ocean. And it obviously has impacts on wildlife and even has impacts on people. So basically, Erica, can you tell us about some of the acute impacts? Obviously these pictures, if you can bring up the next slide, this kind of really shows the you know direct impacts or the more lethal impacts. So can you talk a little bit about the acute effects of some of these contaminants? Yeah, uh, yeah. Acute would be something, for example, that enters into the environment in really large concentrations um, at one time, and generally is associated with things like lethality. And so um, we can look at, for example, the oil bird or the right. bird um, covered in oil, and that's something again we really recognize that's a problem that we don't want our our birds, for example, or our marine mammals to disappear. And oftentimes for acute uh, toxicity, what we're having is those organisms cannot rebound. So even if they don't die um, or it's not lethal concentrations, they often can't basically become back of um, into a functional um, organism in the environment. But we're um, actually kind of now, as we're moving away from more of these historic disasters where we're having large oil spills, um, we are now kind of really focusing on this um, other category, this subacute where a lot of the chemicals that are out there aren't actually causing toxicity, or I'm sorry, aren't actually causing uh, lethality, mm -hmm. um, but they can um, be present at very small concentrations. And whenever they're present at these concentrations, they might cause such issues as endocrine disruption mm -hmm. um, that can disrupt reproductive ability. Or for example, they might affect neuronal health to where they can really alter the behavior of the fish. There's a couple of really great examples of how we've worked with really small concentrations that might be out there in the environment. For example, there's some work out of Canada that worked with really small amounts of a endocrine disrupting compound, um, estrogen based compound. And they basically saw a complete crash in a um, population of fish in about two years. And so there's a number of those types of examples where we're not causing lethality, but major changes, um, for example, in the sex ratio of our populations. So aside from the wildlife, obviously we as Californians eat a lot of fish, right? Yeah. So if the wildlife are accumulating these things and they're having effects on wildlife, what about people? But for example, just starting with the fact that we have all of these chemicals entering into the environment, um, a lot of times what will happen is those chemicals will accumulate in things that we use as a food source. So for example, um, fish or shellfish often accumulate quite a bit of different types of pollution in the environment. And that can actually end up in the, the food chain and be consumed by either humans or other um, fish consuming mammals, for example. And then that creates a real risk now for the human population to where we're seeing again, endocrine disruption problems um, or cancer um, related issues. So, so Jeff, along those lines, obviously you shouldn't be afraid to eat California fish, right. but, but the point is, is how much you might consume, right? Correct. There, some fish do have fish consumption, consumption advisories. For example, white croaker out here. Uh, you know, uh, pregnant women, small children, elderly uh, people that are infirm, they should not be eating this at all. Uh, a healthy uh, adult can uh, consume it once every two weeks. And that's due largely to DDT contamination. But to, put, uh, to build on what Erica said, uh, some of these, things, these compounds and, and chemicals are very, very bio, what we call bioactive at very small concentrations, for example, parts per billion. We are so desensitized to large numbers. You know, athletes make hundreds of millions of dollars and you know, our national debts, you know, 23 trillion, whatever. So to put that into context, something near and dear to my heart, if you take a roll of toilet paper, huge roll of toilet paper with standard squares, and you circle the earth almost three times around, one square is a part per billion. That's and some low. of these are, are bioactive at less than 10 parts per billion. So that kind of puts it into perspective right. of how strong these uh, chemical reactions can be. So we, Long Beach used to be a lot of marsh, right? So historically it was marsh and estuary and we, we've learned that marshes and estuaries are really important buffers. So if we can bring up the next figure. So the next picture kind of shows estuaries as being just that, but we've lost most of them. So from the standpoint of, of marshes, how does this affect Long Beach in particular, our local areas that may have lost a lot of their wetlands? What are the impacts of that? 
Yeah, you know, the major impact, the uh, wetlands provide and estuaries provide an ecosystem service. They act as a filter for contaminants. So you have water coming down from rivers and streams and the, uh, the, the natural vegetation and the sediments and even some of the critters will actually filter contaminants out. So when you take that away, the water goes straight through contaminants and all and ultimately ends up on the beach and in the ocean. And if I can add just yes. a little bit to that, our estuaries and bays have gone away so much from, for example, paving. Right. Um, but then we also have just the fact that the estuaries that we do have will act as a sink. Right. And so they're not healthy estuaries right. um, a lot of the times to where what they were historically to help us with these filtering capacities. A lot of our Southern California estuaries are really impaired. Right. So along those lines, I, I don't think people really understand the services that the ecosystem provides us and how that affects how we use the ocean. So if we can have the next figure. So Erica, you want to talk a little bit about ecosystem services and what that means for us and the ocean? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great term because it really encapsulates basically the benefits that we get from the coastal environment or marine environment, a lot of which are our estuaries. And um, so, for example, we rely pretty heavily on the provisions, for example. So we've talked a lot about food or mm -hmm. shellfish to where um, we recognize that as a benefit from the ocean. But we also get things like biomaterials. For example, um, we get a lot of our medicine actually has come from marine environments. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can also think about how uh, maintenance, where we already have kind of talked and touched on the fact that estuaries act as a buffer. Um, coastal communities can actually act as this nice buffer to where they're maintaining a lot of what we would um, benefit for our air quality, our water quality, um, and shoreline protection. Um, and then last, um, maybe something that we take for granted a little bit is how much we um, rely on it for our well-being mm -hmm. to where we all in Southern California like going to the beach. Um, we all appreciate a, a good sunset. Yeah. Um, and spiritually, um, right. the ocean actually means quite a bit to a lot of people across the globe right. to where if we take that system away, we're losing a lot of the benefits that we might gain from it. And, and many of those benefits historically have been in the source of food, right? So a lot of people used to rely on, this, on the, our coastal ocean as a source of income. California's economy was strongly driven by commercial fishing. And while a lot of that has gone away, there's still a lot of recreational fishing and subsistence fishing in California. So how might that, Jeff, impact basically what people eat or how they fish? You know, it, it has several impacts. One, you talk about the recreational fishery. People want to come to fish and they want to eat what they catch. And if there are fish advisories, they're not going to come here. They're going to go somewhere else to fish. So now we have lost uh, economic uh, dollars. You know, local, our local economy suffers. But, you know, even I think more important than that is there are a lot of people who do subsistence fishing. They, that's their sole protein source or one of their protein sources. I have a boat here in Long Beach in the downtown marina and I talk to the fishermen that are out there on the, on the fishing piers. Many of them are actually, that is their protein source for dinner or, or for the week. They may, they may have three to four meals. It could be white croaker, which there's a fish consumption advisory for, but they don't, they don't go with that advisory because they need to eat. And so if we don't protect the resource, then human health is also at risk. It's not just environmental health. So, but, but I think one of the kind of promising things that we're hearing is that some of those levels are coming down and, and things are slowly kind of getting better and some of those advisories are being reduced. Right. So, I mean, that's, a, that's really good news for the population that's relying on the ocean for subsistence. But it's, it's the next evolution. It's the next group of contaminants that we have to be aware of. So, um, what are the economic impacts of this. So this is something I think we really kind of need to consider. So where pollution comes from, uh, the sources, and then of course the impacts that it has to the ecosystem. But what are the economic impacts of this? So Erica, can you talk a little bit about some of this was done decades ago and we're still basically paying for that? Yeah, so um, kind of along the lines of those legacy contaminants before um, the, a lot of the regulations took place, how we would get rid of things was just in these large dumps, for example. And that can be on land or it can be in our marine system. And those systems are, um, or those areas are heavily contaminated with large amounts of certain types of those legacy contaminants that they've been banned. But we have these huge deposits in these locations that we've named our Superfund sites, where the ones that are the most toxic are a national priority site. 
and the Superfund program, which was really great. In the beginning, it was actually set up to basically act as a trust fund, where uh, companies would pay into this fund to help with potential problems that might come up with these large deposits of pollutants. But unfortunately, that trust fund um, arrangement has kind of gone away. And a lot of that now, the funds needed to clean up or mitigate these sites has really fallen on the states, to where, for example, in California, we have quite a number of these Superfund sites. One of the greatest examples is off of Palo Verdes, where we have one of the largest deposits in the world of DDT, um, as well as PCBs that, again, um, kind of get into the food chain and create real risks. Um, but we also have quite a bit um, throughout the state to where, just to deal with those Superfund sites, the state probably spends about, or will spend, um, about $35 million by the end of 2020 on just mitigating and um, managing these sites so that it doesn't affect coastal communities. So in, in addition to these legacy contaminants, which are compounds that take forever to break down, that could be resident in the environment for long, long periods of time, we have other problems like runoff, which can have clear economic impacts to communities. So Jeff, what happened in Huntington Beach a few years ago? Yeah, in 1999, uh, new legislation went into effect, new regulations, uh, Assembly Bill 411, which tightened the uh, bacterial levels allowable on beaches. And right after that went into effect, there was an exceedance in Huntington Beach that appeared to be a human sewage signal. That county health department closed the beaches and it remained closed all summer. Huntington State Beach remained closed all summer. And what that resulted in was a loss of, in that year alone of $15 million to the local economy because people want to come to the beach to swim. Right. No one was allowed in the water and the surfing went away. You know, it, was, it was devastating to the economy. But even the next year, in 2000, $19 million were lost just because of the perception of what had occurred the year before. And you mentioned urban runoff. That was ultimately found to be the culprit. It was urban runoff. And urban runoff at, in dry weather in July, August, September wasn't really thought to be that, that great. But in our service area alone, which is just north and west Orange County, it adds up to 14 million gallons a day of water that goes into the storm drains and ultimately onto the beaches. A lot of that, you know, comes from people watering their lawns or overwatering their lawns, washing their cars, you know, uh, uh, you know, things like that. Some people wash down their sidewalks, which you shouldn't do, but they do it anyway. And uh, and it again all ends up in the ocean. Uh, what my agency did was we started taking in about three to four million gallons of that, which was all we could handle with our capacity, and it immediately started lowering the bacterial levels on the beaches. So, I mean, these are the things that I think most people don't really think about, right? The things that we do think about, the things that we see all the time is debris in the ocean. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that is plastic. And in many ways, that will be our next legacy contaminant, right? Because it breaks down so slowly. So if we can bring up the next slide, this is kind of what you would see if you go to some beaches, particularly after rainstorms. So, Erica, marine debris is actually having a big economic impact in many communities as well, right? Yeah, so they're starting to um, really recognize how much of an issue it might be in on beaches or in the water to where it's um, very similar to this perceived effect of a clean beach um, relative to how much debris is present on the beach. And so we, same thing um, as a, a beach goer, they choose to go to a beach that um, appears to be cleaner because of the fact that it has less debris. And so they did a survey, there's a recent um, study done by NOAA where they came in and they um, looked and surveyed different beachgoers in Orange County and surveyed how long they would drive actually to go to a beach that they um, knew was cleaner than a more local beach. And what they kind of um, came up with was about $32 million is lost per year based on basically the fact that people travel longer distances and waste their time and their money just going to beaches that don't have so much debris. So those costs obviously go beyond just the cost of cleaning up those those conditions, those beaches, but also, you know, where that trash gets deposited and whether it ends up back at that beach is could be a reoccurring cost for many of these communities. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Like the plastics themselves are a pollutant, and they're actually finding that pollutants can um, stick to plastics. So, uh, plastics are what we call hydrophobic, mm -hmm. and a lot of the pollutants that we work with are also hydrophobic, and so they stick to the plastic. And that's a really interesting way in which pollutants are moving around um, from basically their source where they might have originated to basically our beaches for example where we have this debris and that debris comes with um, the fact that it is also a pollutant as well as the fact that it contains these chemicals that we know could be cancerous for example. 
So obviously this is a huge issue, not just for many cities, but for the governments as well, the state and federal government. And finding solutions to this go beyond just getting people to pick up litter and trash. A lot of times these things can be sustained in the ocean for long periods of time, just swept around in, in what we call the garbage patch. So some of that trash that ends up on our beaches might not even be ours. We're, we're recipients of somebody else's trash, basically. So, so this is not just a problem that we can deal with at a local standpoint. It's not a problem that we can deal with even at the state level or even the national level. This is really an international problem now, right? You know, I think, I think a good example of that is uh, along our beaches, uh, occasionally I'll find things um, that originate in Japan. They, it, they come around, you know, the, the top uh, of the world and down to us. And yeah, this really truly is an international uh, an issue. It's not just what we're creating here ourselves, but we need to be, and we need to be mindful of that. I think that as individuals, we kind of need to question um, how much plastic we do use um, and if it's necessary in every aspect of our life. So this big idea of single use plastics, such as bags you might wrap your sandwich in, for example, yeah. that has one day life, if that, um, and then it goes in the trash. And so if there's ways in which we can move away from those single use plastics, that could have a big um, global impact, I think. So obviously these topics, uh, especially when it comes to marine debris and plastic, will be an ongoing debate. And I think this is a really good time for us to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Ever thought about studying the psychological ecology of sharks using robots? Or maybe spending the day not in a classroom, but aboard a large vessel studying marine life in the ocean firsthand? The opportunities are endless with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to OceanWise, and I would like to once again continue our conversation with Dr. Jeff Armstrong and Dr. Eric Holland. So we were just talking about some of the issues that plague many of our communities in terms of marine pollution, and it's not just Long Beach, it's, it's many places around the country, around the world. But obviously pollution is, is something that's not new, and we've been dealing with it for a very long time, and it's not like we've ignored it. In fact, from a legislative level and a regulatory level, we've been dealing with pollution for a very long time. So if we could bring up the next figure, um, obviously pollution has been a problem that governments have struggled with, and, and it really comes down to why do we need to regulate? So, it, you know, in many ways, we talk about regulations as being too strict and it's impacting, you know, the way we do business and, and how it affects our communities. But in many ways, it's, it's kind of a necessary thing, right? So, Jeff, can you talk a little bit about regulation and legislation in regards to pollution, why it's so important? Yeah, it's really important because we have to have a sustainable, a sustainable environment today and going on into the future. Uh, people generally want to do the right thing. I, I, I believe that, that people really do but they may not know what the right thing is. And you know, back in the day, the axiom was the solution to pollution is dilution. And so everything got dumped in the ocean. It was this vast you know, void of water that could you know, take anything we put in there. And of course, now we know that's not true. And so if we have to be mindful of that. And, and so regulation keeps, it keeps in, in check and, and keeps people doing the right thing. So in many ways, we think of um, regulation for companies and, right. and industry and things like that, but it's actually for people too. And, and I guess it's that concept of death by a thousand cuts, right? Our human population has grown so greatly. We have 38 million people living in California, and we're all contributing in some way to this pollution. And those regulations are sometimes for us as well. But I think the part that most people forget is aside from the trash and many of the other things, it's the chemicals that enter the environment. So Erica, you know, as a toxicologist, that probably is the biggest concern for you. So it's one of the biggest concerns for sure. Um, I would say that um, what these regulations actually have taken us a long way to where um, after World War II, for example, it was kind of this in, um, chemical revolution where better li living through chemistry was kind of the mantra. And that's been great because it gave us a lot of different um, chemicals that have helped us in society. But what we found actually, I guess, with um, the seminal book by Rachel Carson was that if we just have all of this chemistry entering into the environment, we have major problems um, with our wildlife. So for example, DDT was one of the first to be recognized 
recognized as a large problem because it actually causes egg shell thinning in birds. And so that was kind of the first recognition that that can lead to our silent spring, so to speak. Um, but now um, we've initiated the Toxic Substance Control Act, and that's actually taken us a huge distance to say that companies or industries producing chemicals um, can't just put out chemicals into the environment. They have to register it, so to speak. And so they're not necessarily saying that these chemicals are toxic. We just need to know um, what level might become a concern. So some of them, you might need a huge amount to actually cause a toxic response. But we, um, with the TOSCA, um, we now basically have this registry where chemicals will go into this um, system and we have this information. And now we actually have about 70,000 chemicals in TOSCA that are used in products or personal care products, for example, or to make plastics, um, for example, and those can potentially enter into the waste stream. And we know very little about um, the majority of those compounds. So, Jeff, obviously we've, and I realize you're not regulators and you're not legislators, but the process of putting regulations in place, when, how do we figure out that we need new regulations or that we need something new in place? And it, how does that process work? Yeah, the, uh, the process generally starts with scientists like Erica raising a question about, you know, is this, is this chemical going to be harmful and doing the testing and then finding out that it does have an effect. And from there, you know, regulations and, and laws can be either federal, state, local, and even tribal, you know, in some cases. And so, uh, for example, a federal law, and there's laws and there's regulations. And so a federal law, a good example, would be the Clean Water Act. That was something that was proposed by Congress. It was voted on. It went to President Nixon. He signed it into law, and that became the law of the land. Now, we're governed, my agency is governed under uh, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System uh, aspect of the Clean Water Act, and there a good example of a regulation would be we have an anti-degradation clause. There is a clause in in our permit to discharge and to operate that is issued by US EPA and the State Regional Water Quality Control Board that says we cannot damage the environment, we cannot degrade the water quality, sediment quality, or wildlife and plant life. So that's that's a, a regulation. Regulations are proposed by EPA they go through a process of public review, uh, judicial review, and then when they are approved, then they go into, for example, the Clean Water Act as a regulation. I think that we can't really discount. Um, so you had mentioned science as a way that we can kind of come in and we can learn about individual chemicals at a time, for example, to kind of back up the idea that they create a risk once they're present in either the marine environment or, for example, the air. Um, but there's um, a huge effort in the grassroots, grassroots movements to kind of um, bring the uh, culture to it, so to speak, to where individuals can come forward and start grassroots movements. And that actually has a huge uh, standing for where regulations are going to take place. So, for example, we can start seeing what's happening right now in California with the plastic bans, to where that's really been a grassroots movement of small either nonprofits or individuals trying to push for regulation on the use or production of these items. And that's, that's a really good point. And, and it actually brings up this question about, well, we've had regulations and laws in place for a very long time. How do we know if it's working? So, you know, I, I think it's something that people miss because it happens sometimes quite slowly. And as our lives go by, we forget that actually some of these things are working quite well. And California could be a really good example. So, Jeff, in terms of some of the regulations, whether they be the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, if we can bring up the next figure, I think this is a great example of, you know, in the old days, we used to discharge primary treated right. wastewater offshore yeah. and, and things look like sludge. And, and now you can almost get water to the point where it can be consumed. It can be drank. Correct. Actually, we're already there. Uh, if you look at the, the picture, the flask on the left with the darker fluid, that is raw sewage. Uh, there are two levels of treatment, primary and secondary. The middle flask is after primary treatment, which only takes about three hours, and it can remove up to 85% of the solids in there, which is what wastewater treatment is designed to do, is remove solids. Then it goes through another process of secondary treatment, and that's the clean beaker you see on the, on the right. Now, I still wouldn't drink that because there are viruses and bacteria associated with it, but what we're doing now is my agency has partnered with the Orange County Water District, and we're doing what's called the Groundwater Replenishment System, which is the largest wastewater recycling project in the world today. 
And that water, once it goes to Orange County Water District, they do the next level of treatment, which does remove all of the viruses and bacteria and the remaining chemicals. It's very clean water, and that's pumped into the aquifer and is ultimately now a drinking water source for Orange County. I'd say kind of to build off of that, just the fact that we're sitting here talking about kind of the legacy that we had previously to um, regulation and now talking about these subacute effects at really low concentrations is really a great standing that these regulations are helping to make sure that we're not putting a large amounts, large lethal amounts to where now we're just honing in on some of these other issues like reproduction, for example. And that just alone is telling us that we've come a long way and we can go even further. So I think that's a really important point. So quite often what drives these regulations is we reach tipping points where we actually see dramatic impacts to an ecosystem, to wildlife, even to people. And then of course, as the regulations work, it may take decades literally to see you know, the effects of that, but there are still potentially impacts to wildlife. But the key is that we have methods to monitor those, right? And we still have scientists out there looking for those things and, and trying to evaluate maybe populations would recover faster even if we did even a better job at cleaning some of these things up. So uh, probably the next question that I think we really need to start thinking about really comes down to the next challenge. So let's just say some of these things have been very successful with growing populations, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, many of the environmental protections we put in place have really helped bring back the health of our ocean, which 40 years ago was in far more dire straits than it is now. But we are also learning that there are some new emerging problems and they will probably continue to emerge. So Erica, what do you think is probably some of the biggest growing concerns of, of the next issues that we have to deal with? Yeah, I would say I'm um, kind of coming back to the Tosca list where we have about 70,000 chemicals that could potentially be entering into the environment where we know very little about them individually. Um, but what's kind of um, the big challenge is the large number. But then you have to think that it's not just one pollutant that's out there in the environment. It's a, a slew, it's kind of a mixture of these different things. And so we know very little about the, what we call the parent compound and then take that and whenever you put those parent compounds together oftentimes we know absolutely nothing about how they're going to interact with each other so one compound might be present at really low concentrations to where it's almost not even detected but once you put it with other compounds um, it starts creating a real problem and so same thing we've already seen that with um, people have done studies on endocrine to where multiple compounds present in the environment kind of add up to something that's a risk so how many chemicals are we talking about here? <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because oftentimes we don't have the technology to um, measure these compounds or, again, that they're, they're at such small amounts that we just can't detect them, for example. So um, I think that oftentimes we regulate for about, about 100 different compounds um, where there's probably more like 1,000 that are present. Um, wow. and we don't know how they're gonna act. Right. And then kind of bringing up also that once they get into the environment, they often change to where they might have these breakdown products that could be a major problem, but we don't know. So Jeff, in your agency, obviously, mm -hmm. you have chemicals that you have to monitor for, Correct. right? And, and you know, Eric is talking about thousands of chemicals right. in the ocean now that, we, that are registered, that we recognize. And, and so what are you monitoring for and, and how does that fit into your overall kind of monitoring plan and, and right. what's the next issue that you may need to look for? Yeah, uh, we have a, a fully staffed chemistry lab that does, we look at a priority list of pollutants. It's, it's highly regulated. It's uh, dictated to us by the regulators what we, what we look for. And it's only 99 compounds. That's all out of 70,000 that are in use. And actually, if you look at the chemical abstract service for worldwide, uh, currently, there's 147 million chemicals that are known in the world today. So, you know, 99, and that pretty much maxes out our resources. That We have a staff of, you know, almost 30 chemists, and we are, we're also doing in-plant process sampling to make sure our plant's operating, you know, at, at uh, maximum efficiency to make sure we're cleaning the water well enough before we put it out. So it's not just those 99 that we're sampling for, but, you know, that is a huge effort, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is. It can take days and days to even do a few of those compounds. Um, but that's why we have monitoring programs. My ocean monitoring program, we go out into the environment, we have our own research vessel, 
We collect sediment, we collect fish, we collect water, and we, and we test those. And one of the things we look at is the health of the environment. That's the main thing, because we can't test for 70,000 chemicals or even maybe 1,000 that are really an issue. But what we can do is monitor the health of the environment. And if the environment is healthy, then we can say, okay, our discharge in particular is not causing any degradation, so we're okay. Or if something does come up, then we can do a special study to target that, identify it, and then take it out of, out of the stream. Uh, one of the things that's been highly successful for us is our source control program. We have an industrial and non-industrial source control program that's been in effect since 1984 that uh, it's been so effective with such as metal plating industries and whatnot, they cannot discharge into the sewage system until they do pretreatment, and it's been so effective that as of 1990, what's coming into our plant actually meets drinking water standards for heavy metals. That, that's very impressive, right? I mean, this is a yeah. good example of things working. Right. So Eric as a toxicologist and a scientist. I mean, Jeff's talking about standards that are set that he has, his agency has to follow. But obviously, as somebody who's concerned about the next thing coming, science has made great progress in terms of how we can look for those compounds and, and measure biological effects at much smaller levels. Yeah. So what are, the, what are the cool new tools that you have coming <laughs> There's out? There's lots of cool new tools. Um, so kind of taking us through history, just a little bit of um, traditional regulation and kind of still where a lot of our regulation is today is they'll take standard organisms and they'll expose them and look for lethality. And so that's been the method that they've been working with for a really long time. But um, recently, about 2007, 2008, they've really started to push for, let's screen for chemicals and try to address risk before it gets out in the environment. And so it's been this huge national program called the Tox 21 program and it's been um, widely successful to where we're coming in now with molecular tools or cell based tools and we can um, screen for such things as endocrine disruption uh, neuronal issues um, all the way down to for example um, growth hormone for um, and so that's allowed us to gain a huge amount of information on the chemicals that are registered so that we know what types of potential subacute effects that they have so kind of trying to move away from this uh, one chemical um, at a time, so one chemical, one animal at a time, trying to address all of the chemicals that are out there. And um, they're starting to try to address that in mixtures. So trying to put them in mixtures and see That's what that might That's a lot of combinations, right? Yeah, so we have about 10 million uh, data points now yeah. where it's all uh, publicly accessible. You can go in and you can search for the different chemicals. And so for science, that's a huge um, database for us that we can really work with to guide other studies from there. You know, with, with changes in, in the science, there's also changes with regulation. And for example, when I started at, at the sanitation district almost 25 years ago, our toxicity testing was done on adult fish. And we exposed various concentrations of, of clean water with effluent mixed in and, and see who, who survived the longest at what concentration. And we were held to a standard. Now we're using fish that are no more than 14 days old. We're also doing molecular techniques. Uh, we're looking at kelp. We're looking at, at invertebrates, abalone, uh, larvae. Do they, are they developing normally? Instead of just, does it kill an adult organism? So the, the science has evolved. Regulation has evolved with that to be much tighter. Consequently, you know, our product is much cleaner going out. So and that brings up a really good point, right? So it sounds like regulations have been working. In, in, in many cases, we're actually seeing dramatic improvements based on what those regulations are doing. But there's now talk about deregulation. And of course, we've historically, we recognize the problem. So if we can bring up the next figure, um, we've actually had rivers that caught on fire in the United States right. because they were so badly polluted. Right. So if, if all those regulations were put in place to help prevent things like this from happening, right. how are we not gonna go back to that? So can you talk a little bit about regulation and the potential impacts of deregulation. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the picture is of the Cuyahoga River, and I believe that picture is from 1969, which was the last time, the last time that it caught fire. Between 1868 and 1969, it caught fire 13 times due to chemical pollution. The Cuyahoga River was a complete dead zone. There wasn't even microbial life there, nothing. The clean water, that was one of the, the 69 fire was one of the impetuses for the uh, Clean Water Act. That legislation went into effect, and Ohio EPA also, they tightened their restrictions as well. And within decades, the Cuyahoga River had recovered. There are, there's microbial life, there's fish and, and uh, vegetation there in most areas. Uh, but people are seeking to roll back 
aspects of the Clean Water Act, and they're looking closely at uh, the Clean Water Act specifies it applies to navigable waters of the United States, and that's still being contested in the Supreme Court as to what navigable means. Mm -hmm. And you know, if these invest, if these uh, 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 statutes roll back and we go back to our old way of doing things, that could return. You know, another example off our own coast here would be before the uh, Clean Water Act. Primary treatment was the word of the day for, for sewage, and there were sludge lines that went off the coast, and the water was t uh, put out in one pipe, but just sewage sludge was put out in another. And our data from our agency shows that back in 1969-70, before the Clean Water Act came in, about 20% of the Dover sole that we collected had some kind of abnormality, uh, fin rot, uh, lesions, tumors, whatever it might be. Uh, but the Clean Water Act mandated secondary treatment, sludge is dealt with on an onshore basis now, and as a result, now that level is about a tenth of one percent, which is background for uh, even, you know, clean areas. So that's a huge success. We don't want to see that rolled back. I think that kind of a modern example for, um, is what happened in Flint, Michigan, yeah. to where um, that was just kind of a switch in water source, so drinking water source for the city of Flint, to where they went from Michigan Lake to the um, Flint River as a source, and they um, didn't follow the regulations that were necessary to prove that that water was safe for drinking water. And so it went into the, the pipes and ultimately caught it, caused corrosion of the pipes. And that led to a huge amount of lead into the drinking water source. And within a year, they had huge um, issues with um, people in hospitals with lead poisoning. So obviously, we're talking about a lot of freshwater examples, and you did mention a marine example. So um, what do you think some of the concerns should be about the marine environment if we do experience significant deregulation in Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act? I can think of two examples where they're starting to try to roll back some of the regulation that was put in um, place in the 2008-2010 to where they're trying to um, roll back some of the safety that was placed after the big BP spill, which was the now the largest um, oil spill in the entire globe. Um, major repercussions and costs associated with that spill and so they came in with regulations trying to have better safety standards on the oil rigs and so they're trying to roll those safety standards back which could have huge impacts on uh, coastal communities, especially where they do drilling. Um, and then there's also, they're trying to roll back some of the coal burning standards for mercury that's gonna leave from our coal burning uh, power plants to where um, mercury again gets into the air that's ultimately going to fall down through air deposition or rain into our communities, our uh, marine coastal environments. And that's then um, potentially gonna be, again, this problem with mercury that's a huge issue for consumption of fish. So obviously these are things happening at the federal level. The state of California is, I am very proud to be a Californian, I have to say, because you know, California takes a very strong progressive role in environmental regulation and protection. And I think that's something that California's holding in regards to you know, potential deregulation. I think the state of California is tending to hold the line, in fact, even push the line in terms of environmental protection. So do you know of any new environmental protections that will help in the future? Actually, this isn't new, but it gets updated on a three-year basis, and it's called the California Ocean Plan. And that's actually more stringent than the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act is the federal law of the land, but states, individual, like you said, I'm proud to be a, a born and raised Californian too, for, one of, for many reasons, and this is one, and that is we take this seriously and we regulate to a, a greater degree than is required. The California Ocean Plan uh, is un under review this year and they look at current issues and uh, the state of the science and uh, analysis techniques, and they decide what California will deem acceptable. And that is generally stricter than the federal guidelines. So uh, yeah, we will, we will regulate to a greater degree than the rest of the country. So everything that we talked about so far, particularly the regulations, and again, I think a lot of people think of this as these are things put on, on industries and, and companies and things like that, but when it comes to our individual contributions to these things, there's obviously a lot we can do as citizens. So Erica, what should our mantra be? <laughs> Our mantra should go back to the reduce, reuse, recycle. So if we can just um, 
limit the what we are either putting into the environment or using altogether. Um, there's this new kind of added to the motto, this idea of refuse. And so that's really becoming important for driving the plastic grass movement, where it's really this idea that we should kind of refuse these products that come with ridiculous amounts of packaging, for example, to where that can really help then uh, reduce the waste stream of these plastics. So if we can bring up the next slide. I think this kind of illustrates that this has been a constant progress in California. So obviously we started with banning bags and as a person who was out in the ocean a lot, I was seeing disposable plastic bags all the time and they would wrap around my propeller, the ban went into place and then literally within a year I started to see major differences, uh, fewer and fewer bags out in the water. But now we have other issues. We have straws and, and a lot of people argue straws are really small contribution yeah. when it comes to global plastic, but it's it's a step, right? So you want to talk a little bit about where we probably should be heading in terms of regulating single-use plastic? Uh, yeah, so I guess again just um uh, refuse is kind of the, the motto to where at restaurants we don't need to accept straws. Um, the bag ban has really helped us to where just be cognizant and take your bags with you. I think um, where we might be heading with single um, is um, now the takeout where, for example, we've taken away that polystyrene um, clamshell that you would take for takeout, which can be really important. Um, we're working on, for example, things like the coolers, those styrofoam coolers actually, those create a huge problem because they break down into these little um, smaller plastics that then get into the environment. Um, and so I think that we just need to question what types of items um, rely on plastic and go from there as far as um, not using so much of it in our daily lives. So in addition to the plastic that we use, we also have <laughs> around our homes, we have our plants, we love our plants. Yeah. Um, obviously that poses another single point. Uh, an individual is making a contribution to contaminants that eventually end up in the ocean. So what are kind of the things that we can do to prevent what we do at home? Yeah, so as Jeff kind of brought up earlier, there's this um, residential uh, runoff that we have that maybe we often don't think of as a problem, but at our homes, right, we spray a huge amount of, or not huge, but we often will spray pesticides around our home to protect our plants or we'll, um, we'll spray, spray herbicides. And ultimately, once it rains or you over water, for example, that's gonna end up in our water system. And so if you can uh, reduce the use of pesticides or herbicides, maybe eliminate them completely and go with more um, natural options, or if anything, just um, read the back of the package and actually <laughs> follow the directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> excuse me, um, follow the fact that more is not always better. And so if you follow the actual application guidelines and you follow the fact that you don't put it on right before rain um, or right before you water. So Jeff, obviously we have benefited from the chemicals that Eric was talking about sure. have enabled us to live longer, more productive lives, but those chemicals we do excrete. And, and aside from those, they're the leftovers that we have. So right. drugs getting in the environment, pharmaceuticals in the environment is a big problem, right? So what can people do? Yeah, the best thing that you can do is uh, public education, no drugs down the drain. You know, back in the day, again, you know, pharmacists would tell people, oh, if you don't use all your drugs, just flush them down the toilet. No, there are better ways to deal with that because that, it does end up in the environment. So there are take back programs in most pharmacies. They have bins where you can just deposit your, your old ones or you can crush them up and put them with coffee grounds and just put them in the trash. But the worst thing that people can do is put it into, into the waste stream. Uh, you know, and the other thing is educate your kids you know model the behavior and teach them you know to recycle and to ex dispose of things the right way and then they're going to teach their children and and that will have a, a ripple effect you know through the generations so are there any other things that you think we need to be cognizant of in regards to marine pollution that we can do as individuals yeah one one more thing this is something that we do uh, our vessel is out 100 to 120 days a year. We have what we call the balloon rescue yeah. unit, the BRU. <laughs> Mylar balloons that people release, that's a form of aerial deposition of contaminants. And we find these things out there. Over the past three years, we've collected over 250 sets of balloons. I, we don't know how many individual balloons. Right. So we do what we can do to keep them out. So, you know, just be mindful of what you're doing and potential impacts. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to thank my guests for their insight, for their contributions. Obviously, you know a lot about these things, and we could spend 
hours, days, weeks talking about marine pollution, and we've only kind of scratched the surface here. But hopefully we've given you an idea of some of the current problems that we face. More importantly, hopefully we've built some hope. Hopefully we've encouraged you that some of the regulations and technology that we're using along our coast is actually helping, and we're, we're actually seeing improvements in some of our coast solutions. But with that said, we do have global problems that we have to deal with that go beyond what we can do at our local, state, or federal level. Um, so hopefully you will tune back to learn more about OceanWise and the things that we're talking about and the topics that we cover. And hopefully you will all help contribute to cleaning up California's coastal oceans so that you can enjoy it the same way we do. So thank you.